Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's event, part of the York Festival of Ideas. My name is Karen Bloor. I'm a professor in the Department of Health Sciences at the University of York. Before I introduce our speaker and the fascinating and incredibly timely topic for this evening, just a few technical notes. If you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen. This is available throughout the event, so please ask questions at any time. Should you have technical issues such as loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. Please remember that today's event is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch again and recommend it to your friends. Subtitles are, are available in this event. To turn these on or off, use the CC Live Transcript button at the bottom of your screen. So this evening, I'm delighted to introduce Peter Furtado, who's a historian and former editor of History Today, the world's leading history magazine. His publications include the Sunday Times bestseller, Histories of Nations, as well as Revolutions, How They Changed History and What They Mean Today, and Great Cities Through Travelers' Eyes. But he's here, to, uh, here today to talk to us about plagues, pestilence, and pandemics using first-hand accounts from the ancient world to the present day. Thank you for coming, Peter, and over to you. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for being here, considering that uh, so many people have got pandemic, plague, and pestilence fatigue by this point, and it's such a beautiful day. So um, anyway, I hope that it's going to be worth your time. I suppose, um, in some ways, we've been pretty fortunate um, suppose that COVID had happened just 20 years ago, uh, no social media, so people would have got their news from the TV and the press, no Zoom, so not much working from home, online schooling, exercise classes, social groups or family meetups, just months of real boredom and isolation, no online, online groceries, no phone apps, so real time big data is less comprehensive, less granular. Communication and collaboration between the world's scientists is mostly by email. Analysis of the virus's genetic code takes longer. The vaccine's probably slower to develop and distribute. Frustrations build and more people, perhaps far more people, die. The amazing science, technology and global collaboration, however flawed, may be new, but the key public health strategies used for COVID Lockdown, social distancing, isolation, quarantines, shielding, masks, hygiene have barely changed for centuries. Most of them would have been familiar during the Black Death. So too with the fear of quack remedies, the fake news, the conspiracy theories, the sense that we are pawns of forces beyond our individual understanding, forces that can suddenly kill and apparently at random. 18 months ago, to read about the pandemics of the past was to visit an unfamiliar world. The accounts by Samuel Pepys and Daniel Defoe of London's plague year were well known, but they were remote from our experiences. But today, who does not know exactly how Pepys felt on the 20th of September, 1665? He wrote, Lord, what a sad time it is to see no boats upon the river and grass grows all up and down Whitehall Court, and nobody but poor wretches in the streets. And, which is worst of all, the Duke showed us the number of the plague this week. It has increased about 600 more than last week, which is quite contrary to our hopes and expectations from the coldness of the late season. We are aware of the Great Plague because Pepys and Defoe wrote so well about it, but many other pandemics, since the first one recorded in Athens in 430 BC, have had a less high profile press. The most deadly pandemic of modern times caused perhaps 50 million deaths worldwide, well over 10 times as many as COVID to date. But in part because it coincided with the final weeks of the First World War and struck many households that had already lost husbands, sons, brothers, lovers to the fighting. The so-called Spanish flu pandemic mostly took place behind closed doors. The press was restrained. Workplaces and towns 
remained busy. The whole pandemic was soon little more than a sad footnote to the more public tragedy of the Great War, a footnote made flesh in Paris on November 13th, 1918, two days after the war ended, at the funeral of avant-garde poet Guillaume Apollinaire, which was attended by many cultural giants, including Picasso. Apollinaire's friend Blaise Sondrard wrote, the casket left the church draped in a flag. Guillaume's lieutenant helmet was on the tricolore among the flowers and the reeds. A guard of honor led the slow convoy. But as it reached the corner of Saint-Germain, the cortege was besieged by a crowd of noisy celebrants of the armistice, men and women with arms waving, singing, dancing, kissing, shouting deliriously. It was fantastic. Paris was celebrating. Apollinaire was lost. I was full of melancholy. It was absurd. Even at the time, the Spanish flu pandemic was understood as a product of a world in which people moved across the globe at speed and mixed in pro close proximity. Incubated in military camps, it had much in common with the war itself. There was much to be learned what caused it, how to treat it, how to slow its spread, but also how a pandemic was part of life, something for which the authorities could and should plan. This is what American George Price meant in nine, December 1918, when he called the Spanish flu both destroyer and teacher. While those like Price with a professional interest in public health have tried to learn the lessons from past pandemics and prepare for the next, they have not always had the consistent backing of their political bosses. Think uh, Trump or Bolsonaro at the very least. Price's colleague George Soper wrote in 1919, the most astonishing thing about the pandemic was the complete mystery which surrounded it. Nobody seemed to know what the disease was, where it came from or how to stop it. Anxious minds are inquiring today whether there will be another wave of it will come again. The subsequent hundred years have removed much of that mystery. Pathogens, their structure, their life cycle are now understood in extraordinary detail. Antibiotics, antivirals, vaccines, treatments are developed with astonishing speed. Despite Trump, international cooperation and public health has seen several triumphs, smallpox eradicated in the wild and polio almost so. Indeed, in 1972, Nobel Prize winning virologist MacFarlane Burnett argued that the likely future of infectious disease would be, quote, very dull. There might be, he said, some wholly unexpected emergence of a new and dangerous infectious disease, but nothing of the sort has marked the last 50 years. As it's turned out, the last half century following his remarks has seen many more and more diverse pandemics than ever before. From HIV to Ebola, from mad cow disease to Zika, from Legionnaire's disease to COVID-19, the array of deadly novel pathogens has grown. And we are forced to take ever more drastic action against them. In the 1950s and 60s, Asian flu killed as many people as COVID has done, yet citizens were nowhere locked indoors for weeks on end. Today's baby boomers, who as kids suffered infection, look back with a mixture of amazement and pride at the lack of measures to control infection. One sufferer, then aged 11, recalls how at school, quote, half the teaching staff were victims, the timetable collapsed. We spent our time in mixed class groups supervised by random teachers. We were told to read, wait for symptoms. In 2020, only extreme COVID skeptics could advocate such an approach. The difference was less in the virulence of the pathogen as in the complexity of a world so tightly integrated, so dependent on ceaseless movement of goods and people, that the disruption of a stricken population appears even worse than that of the costly measures taken against it. So as we process the COVID shock emotionally and politically, history may offer some help. Pandemics have happened ever since people began to crowd together in cities and to move across the earth in large numbers. 
Many of those who lived through them have written about what they saw, what they felt and what they did. Their words are both eerily familiar and interestingly different, a helpful pers perspective for us to make sense of the last 18 months. And while the basic public health measures may have been practiced for centuries, their effectiveness was of course long restricted by ignorance. Scientists today know incomparably more than they did in 1918. Yet popular understanding of why a pandemic begins and spreads, why it hits particular individuals at a particular time have advanced nothing like so fast. I think that even the most rational of us have sometimes been as deeply disturbed as were people at the time of the Black Death by an invisible enemy that suddenly appeared and struck down some of our loved ones and not others apparently at random. The popular response reveals much about our society. Some tried to blame the Chinese for their lack of hygiene, for carelessness or worse. Others claimed that the race for a vaccine was really an attempt to microchip and thereby control every person on earth. The Black Death was also blamed on hated outsiders, notably the Jews who suffered grievously for this. And it was explained as God's anger at society's carnal excesses. Some tried to allay that anger by public flagellation. Others doubled down by getting as much pleasure under their belt as quickly as they could. The Florentine poet Giovanni Boccaccio wrote the Decameron, a set of stories purportedly told to pass the time by a group of wealthy young Florentines who had escaped the city to avoid the plague. He also provided a lengthy account of its impact in words that echo many other accounts of pandemics from the classical world onwards. Some thought they could avoid the illness by moderate living, so they shut themselves in houses where nobody had been sick, partook of good food and fine wine, tried not to hear any news, but busied themselves with music and other pleasures. Others, though, believed that alcohol, singing and laughter were the best medicine. They went from tavern to tavern drinking, having fun. This was made all the easier, as many people had abandoned their homes and possessions as they could no longer cope with life. So, Many houses had become common property where complete strangers could make use of whatever they contained. Most of the poor, though, stayed at home. They fell sick by the thousand every day, um, while those who died in their homes were discovered only by the smell of their decomposing bodies. Nor were the dead honored with tears, flames, or companions. Human bodies were disposed of much as we would now dispose of a dead goat. For most people in the past, a pandemic was a once in a lifetime experience and this affected what they wrote. Moralists explained the origins of the nightmare, poets distilled the suffering. The Florentine poet Petrarch, for example, lost his beloved muse Laura to the Black Death and his brother, a monk was the sole member of his monastery to survive the plague. He wrote, Alas, my dear brother, what can I say? Where shall I turn? On all sides, the sorrow everywhere is fear. I wish I'd never been born, or at least had died before these times. How will posterity believe there has ever been a time like this when, without thunderbolts from heaven or fires on earth, without wars, almost the whole globe has been left uninhabited? When has such a thing ever been seen before? What annals relate? Houses left vacant, cities deserted, the country neglected, the fields too small for the dead, and a universal solitude over the whole earth. The people of the future who have not known these miseries will be fortunate indeed. Perhaps they will class our testimony as fiction. Since ancient times, physicians have described how they were advancing their understanding of the disease and curing it, while survivors have described the nightmare of a long feared disease entering your home or your own body. If you were truly blessed, you might get divine assistance as the Greek orator Aelius Aristides did when he was struck down by a mysterious pandemic, perhaps smallpox, 
in AD 165. He said, I perceived my body slipping away until I was nearly dead. I happened to turn to the inside of my bed and it seemed it was then the end. But Asclepius, the god of healing, turned me suddenly back to the outside and then, not much later, Athena herself appeared with her aegis and the scent of her aegis was as sweet as could be and marvellous in beauty and magnitude. I pointed her out to those present, two of my friends and my sister, and I named her Athena. They were afraid I had become delirious, but they saw my strength was restored. They heard the words which she had spoken. The goddess consoled me and saved me while I was on my sickbed. Another person to receive divine assistance was Margaret, daughter of English statesman and Saint Thomas More. Uh, Margaret is sitting in the front on the left in this drawing by Holbein. Uh, and in 1528, she was struck down by the mysterious sweating sickness, a sickness that normally brought death in 24 hours. More commented later about the English sweat as it was known that, quote, it was safer to be on a battlefield than in the city. But this account of Margaret's illness is by her husband, William Roper. In his chapel, on his knees with tears, her father, Thomas, most devoutly besought Almighty God, if it were his blessed will, to vouchsafe graciously to hear his humble position. Where incontinent came into his mind that a glister, which means an enema, should be the only way to help her. When he told the physicians, they confessed that if there were any hope of health, then this was the very best help indeed. Indeed, they much marveled that they hadn't thought of it themselves. And it was immediately administered to her sleeping. Contrary to all their expectations, she was, it was thought by her father's most fervent prayers, miraculously recovered and at length brought to health, perfect health restored. Some people, though, thought that earthly authorities also had a role in alleviating the effects of a pandemic. One such pandemic was the sudden arrival and spread across Europe of a virulent strain of syphilis from the late 1490s. A year after Moore's prayers had helped cure his daughter, his friend Erasmus wrote a dialogue in which two men described the tragedy of a young and innocent girl marrying a pox-ridden lecher. And they debate what actions, if any, the powers that be should take in response to this new threat to the social and medical order. One comments, it is a wonder to me that princes whose business it is to take care of the Commonwealth should find no remedy for this evil. This egregious pestilence has infected a great part of the earth, yet the princes lie snoring and pay no attention as if it were a matter not worthy of their attention. His solution, this is the character in the dialogue, probably not Erasmus's solution, was extreme. He wanted to burn all those who caught the disease before they could spread it. But until very recently, state and city governments have often been at a loss in the face of a deadly epidemic. They did what they could. The Byzantine emperor Justinian paid for the burial of the bodies of plague victims that otherwise would have rotted on the street. The Black Death and its aftermath marked a step forward in public health experiments. In 1348, the Mamluk governor of Damascus ordered a public fast and organized a multi-faith service of Muslims, Jews, and Christians that was credited with slashing plague infection rates. The Mamluk governor of Cairo, by contrast, banned women from visiting the marketplace, though he was forced to change his mind when the traders found their business was disappearing. Venice introduced quarantine for visiting ships. In 1665, the mayor of London's regulations included self-isolation of the sick, social distancing, hygiene measures, especially at shops, masks, 
and other practices with which we are now wearily familiar. But even very recently, heads of government have been unwilling to get involved, perhaps thinking there aren't many votes in pandemics. A few decades ago, Ronald Reagan, fearful of an evangelical backlash, signally failed to take any action on the spread of AIDS in the United States, while South African President Thabo Mbeke denied that HIV alone could cause full-blown AIDS, which he saw as a product of colonialism and racism rather than a public health issue. In 2002, he argued that, quote, for centuries, we have carried the burden of the crimes and falsities of scientific Eurocentrism, its dogmas opposed upon us as the brands of a definitive universal truth. Against this, we have made the statement to which we will remain loyal that we are human and African. Because we are human, we shall no longer permit control by a colonial mother who claims for herself the right unceasingly to restrain us from reclaiming our dignity. Mbeke's refusal to sanction the use of retroviral drugs, even for pregnant women, is thought to have resulted in 300,000 preventable deaths. One of the first pandemics to be described in detail, though not enough detail, sadly, for the pathogen to be identified, was the Athenian plague of 430 BC, of which the historian Thucydides was both eyewitness and survivor. His account, which influenced Boccaccio and many other writers on pandemics, begins with the Athenians watching the sickness approach from Egypt via the Greek islands, and it describes both the symptoms, the shocking sights, and the moral decline that ensued. In contrast to the rationalistic Thucydides, who found no room for divine involvement in such human affairs, the Christian world saw pandemics as an act of God, a punishment, or a teaching, or both. Thus, in the 540s AD, Byzantine cleric John of Ephesus, writing about the so-called plague of Justinian, the first visitation of bubonic plague in the West, which may have killed tens of millions, he described the usual shocking scenes and concluded, when this chastisement came upon Byzantium, the abundant benignity and grace of God appeared with it. Although this just chastisement was very frightening and severe, we should not see it only as a sign of threat and wrath, but also as a sign of grace and a call to repentance. For the scourge used patience until it arrived at a place, just as a king warns his enemies, I'm coming, be prepared, it'll, or it'll be too late for you. So this scourge sent its messages from city to city as if to say, turn back and repent for I am coming and shall make your riches worthless. And John describes how some people seeing the plague would soon arrive in, in Constantinople, quote, managed to build ships for transport themselves and people in need. Others achieved salvation by giving alms and distributing their positions to the needy. Still others by lamentation and humility, vigils and abstinence and woeful calling upon God. In this way, many people bought for themselves the kingdom of God. A millennium later, Martin Luther took the idea of a pandemic being a sign of God's grace a step further when he was asked whether it was acceptable for a Christian to flee an outbreak of plague. This he know, this I know, he said, that if Christ himself were laid low by illness, everyone would be concerned, no one would flee. And yet people don't hear what Christ says, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. If you won't serve your neighbour, you can be sure that if Christ lay there, you would have let him die there too. Pandemics often result when a susceptible population is exposed to a pathogen that may be endemic in a different part of the world. As a result, they are often the byproduct of war. 
from the Antonine Plague, which the Romans themselves believed to have originated with the sacking of a temple of Apollo by their armies campaigning in Mesopotamia, to syphilis, which was known as the French disease or the Neapolitan disease, depending on which side you supported in the Italian wars, or uh, more positively, to uh, the US armies in Cuba in 1798, doing trials to experiment uh, to identify yellow fever as a mosquito-borne disease in Cuba, the histories of war and disease are fatally intertwined. Typhus proved deadly during Napoleon's retreat from Moscow, the American Civil War, the German concentration camps, and more. Today, the threat of aggressive pathogens used as biological weapons haunts our nightmares. Imperial expansion in particular has been disastrously linked with the spread of pandemic disease. The Black Death was spread across Asia by marauding Mongols. Cholera, long endemic in Bengal, only became a global killer when the British army encountered it in the 1810s. The age of European expansion that produced and catastrophic exchange of pathogens between the old world and the new with smallpox and measles causing genocide among native populations such that many observers were appalled. The Spanish friar Motolinia described the sufferings of the Mexicans as being worse than those of the bib biblical Egyptians. And in 1633, William Bradford, pilgrim father and Puritan governor of New Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts, wrote of the sufferings of the Ungolquin Indians with equal horror and compassion. American, in, uh, uh, sorry, African Americans were once wrongly thought to be immune to yellow fever, a disease that had originated in Africa. And in 1793, when a serious outbreak hit the white population of Philadelphia, the mayor and the medical establishment urged the free back black community of the city to volunteer to nurse their white fellow citizens and to bury the dead. Some 250 stepped up and died, all of them. Of course, for most of history, physicians have had to work in the dark, ignorant of the pathogen, just guessing at the conditions in which the disease thrived. Patients did not always trust the efforts of honest medical men, which could after all be worse than useless, but even more expressed anger at those who promoted cures that were purely cynical. The apothecary William Boghurst was scathing about what happened in 1665 when more honest physicians left London. Sweating was the most general course taken, yet other ways were attempted by rude and ignorant people such as purging, vomiting and bleeding. The physicians, almost all going out of town, left the poor people a prey to these devouring, blunt fellows. These umpstart empirics made sad work, both with the people's bodies and their purses, selling their idle medicines at an extraordinarily dear rate. One sold purging pills at half a crown a pill, another five pence an ounce, an ointment. They also sold pomanders very dear and plasters five shillings apiece. I met one who bragged much of a water he had. I asked him how this water would affect a cure and he told me by purging, vomiting and bleeding all at the same time. Daniel Defoe also raged against those who exploited people's fears. The common people ran to conjurers and witches and all sorts of deceivers to know what should become of them and stored much multitudes of pills, potions, and preservatives, so that they not only spent their money, but poisoned themselves beforehand for fear of the poison of the infection. Variolation or inoculation against smallpox by prompting a mild outbreak under relatively controlled conditions was often effective, though it could be dangerous. It had been practiced since at least the 17th century and both it and the much safer vaccination introduced at the beginning of the 19th had been controversial for most of that time. 
One energetic proponent of variolation was Benjamin Franklin, who wrote, in 1736, I lost one of my sons, a fine boy, four years old, to the smallpox. I long regretted, bitterly, I still regret, I had not given it to him by inoculation. This I mentioned for the sake of parents who omit that operation on the supposition that they should never forgive themselves if a child died under it. My example shows that the regret may be the same either way and that therefore the safer way is the way to choose. Smallpox is of course now eradicated in the wild. One of the leaders of the campaign to achieve this, William Foger, described the obstacles that he faced in West Africa in the late 60s, the so-called feticheurs who made their living by selling a cure. They collected smallpox scabs and secretly scratched their clients to infect them. They were doing a form of underhand variolation. Ferger says, the disappearance of smallpox in West Africa was bad business. And the fetishers did not give up their entire smallpox enterprise without a fight. Multiple fetishers visited the last smallpox patient in Benin in order to harvest his scabs, but they were unable to propagate the virus and the smallpox disappeared despite their best efforts. Adapting to market chances, some began to consult instead on cases of chickenpox, which had a much higher success rate for recovery. It was only in the later 19th century that Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch had proved that bacteria could cause diseases, and some decades passed before the first virus pathogens were identified. Some earlier doctors had proposed a germ theory of disease, but well into the 20th century, the idea persisted that the epidemics were the product of something more intangible. Whether it was an imbalance in the bodily humors, obviously the medieval idea, the rare conjunction of the planets, or a so-called miasma, or bad air. Polio, a deadly disease, particularly in the early and mid 20th century, was thought to be a disease of dirt and bad air. The virus was isolated only in 1931. In 1916, when it killed 6,000 children in New York alone, the new Newark Evening News blamed its spread, as you see on the house fly. And at the same time in the early 20th century, track and trace was developed as an uh, anti-pandemic measure. In 1907, George Soper in New York identified one super spreader of typhoid. He wrote, I made an investigation into an outbreak of typhoid fever in a house which had been rented out for the summer. Six of the 11 persons in the household were taken sick. Having inquired if there had been any carriers in the house before the outbreak occurred, I came through the process of exclusion to the cook. But where was she? She had left six months ago. I tried to find out everything I could about her, but there wasn't much to learn. The other servants knew little. She was not particularly clean. Her name was Mary Mallon. That was about all. It was not at first clear how the family could have been infected by this cook, for where there are so many servants, there is little food that a cook handles, which is not subsequently raised to a temperature sufficient to make it harmless. However, one Sunday, Mary had prepared a dessert of which everyone was extremely fond ice cream with fresh peaches cut up in it. I suppose that no better way could be found for a cook to cleanse her hands of microbes and infect a family. When at length I caught up with her, Mary was working as a cook in a house on Park Avenue. I had my first talk with her in the kitchen of this house. I suppose it was an unusual kind of interview. Mary was about 40 years of age, five foot six tall, a blonde with clear blue eyes, a healthy color and somewhat determined mouth and jaw. She had a good figure and might have been called athletic if she hadn't been a little too heavy. I think she was born in the north of Ireland. I was um, as diplomatic as possible, but I had to say I suspected her of making people sick and I wanted specimens of her urine, her feces, 
her blood. It did not take Mary long to react to this suggestion. She seized a carving fork and advanced in my direction. I passed rapidly down the long narrow hall through the tall iron gate and out to the sidewalk. I felt rather lucky to escape. Typhoid Mary, as you may know, did not get off so lightly and she spent most of the remaining 30 years of her life in enforced quarantine. Disease prevention, case tracing, immunization and treatment among both military and civilian populations was crucial in the First and the Second World War. After the Allies liberated Naples in late September 43, the city was faced with a typhus epidemic which had to be treated with DDT. The Americans swung into action with a speed that Dido Harding mm, surely wishes she could manage to match. Dusting operations were instituted on the 15th of December. A team of workers dusted all the outbound passengers boarding a train scheduled to leave for Bari. The following day, contact dusting teams were organized and sent out to addresses of reported cases of typhus emanating from homes and institutions. Each team was instructed to report any new cases or suspected cases of typhus. These teams discovered many new cases which had not previously been reported to or isolated by the civil health authorities. The importance of proper case finding and reporting was so apparent, a special case finding section was organized. By the 26th of December, 11 days after this first, uh, this had begun, the typhus control program provided for six operational sections. Four of them were utilized from the outset case finding, contact delousing, mass delousing, and immunization. Finally, pandemics have always challenged the imagination. Extreme events of love and loss, sudden changes to the way that we live, urgent questions about the meaning and value of human life. These are the realm of the spirit as much as the laboratory and the government archive. New forms of expression are sometimes needed. Faced with a new sexually transmitted disease, the 16th century scientist and physician Girolamo Fracastoro, up here on the left, resorted to the form of epic poetry to express its nightmarish impact. He chose the story of a young shepherd in Arcadia who was named Syphilus, who cursed Apollo for sending a drought and was afflicted as punishment. Fra Castoro thereby permanently named the disease. Though the horrors of mass death through disease was perhaps seen as too squalid for many 19th century writers, the more genteel suffering brought on, tuberculosis, brought on by tuberculosis was a staple of 19th and early 20th century literature. In recent decades, creative writers have again found pandemic a, to, a topic to grapple with. Albert Camus wrote, uh, I'm, I'm right here, an unforgettable account of the plague in one North African city. COVID has inspired all kinds of creative work, both visual and written and perhaps it will become to see, be seen as the blogging pandemic. The destroyer and teacher has done huge damage, but it may have taught us new ways of being, may have helped us find new ways, forms to express them, and perhaps also to look back at the past with more understanding and more compassion than we've had before. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Peter. And you'll have to imagine the sort of waves and of, of applause and, you know, frantic cheering that would be going on were you actually in a hall. So that was absolutely fascinating. And I'm so struck by, despite what you said at the beginning, which is look how much technology has changed our experience of the pandemic. I'm so struck by what what isn't different, what 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 you know, how familiar some of the things from the past are. 
um, with our current experience. So absolutely fascinating stuff. Thanks so much. Thank um, I'm going to give our audience a chance to write some questions in the Q&A box. But um, if, if I'm allowed to ask you a couple first, um, you commented on um, Trump and Tabo and Becky. And I just wondered if you had other examples of the relationships between rulers and scientists or doctors in the past and, and whether this sort of denial of the pandemic and sort of, I don't know, yeah, attitudes, whether attitudes were similar or, or different in the past. Um, I think that, uh, I'm cer certainly, I think um, Queen Victoria was certainly interested in work that was being done to support uh, uh, medical advances and cholera and other, other areas, but um, there are not many other examples, I think, for, um, for, for rulers getting heavily involved. I mean, it's interesting about the span the Spanish flu that uh, the cabinet and parliament never discussed it um, during the during the, the peak of the pandemic in September October uh, 1918. Um, and I, I, my feeling is that in in general um, they left it to the cities, um, to the towns, to the people on the ground, as it were, rather um, to 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 bring in whatever measures that they could, and uh, and otherwise um, kept the the national government kept kept out of it. Okay, I see. Thank you. Um, there's a few questions, and the the first one is um, a comment about um, about changing societies, changing cities, perhaps, and and changing. Um, attitudes to alcohol and, and gathering. And so the contrasts made between um, living on a main road with seven pubs at the end of uh, the end of nearby roads and, uh, you know, small groups of men, um, and it probably was just men going to the pub for an hour or two in small crowds, um, not drinking too much in, in contrast to masses of people um, you know, crowding together, drinking far too much um, and staying out of control. And so um, I wonder if there's any observable relationship between alcohol and um, and the, the spread of pandemics, or uh, you commented, I think, on, on those going to inns and taverns um, compared with those staying at home. Um, yeah, so is there any any link you could make in the past with, with alcohol and, and um, pandemic transmission? Yeah. That's an interesting. That's an interesting question. I think. I think probably it's the mass grouping of people, which of course in the past would, would tend to be with armies and, and marketplaces, um, rather than sports events or, or or people gathering in huge numbers in pubs. Um, certainly, uh, Lusa makes a comment about people um, going out drinking a lot and then. Or at least rumor, what he says are rumors of people going out drinking a lot and then intentionally trying to spread the disease um, and saying he can't believe this is true and if it is true it can't be German people who do it. Mm -hmm. so, um, I, I don't know any examples of people saying sort of mass imbibing uh, it's the cause of, of, of pan pan pandemic disease otherwise. Interesting question, though. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, another another question from the from the audience is, is COVID unusual in being a particular risk to older people? And were the um, were we, you know, was the Black Death and other plagues similarly slaughter of older folks? The, the Spanish flu um, particularly attacked younger people, um, which was one reason why it was um, firstly difficult to understand, and secondly why it was particularly dangerous. Obviously, the spreading them um, in the um, in the in the army, uh, in the army camps, and um, the sweating sickness, which I mentioned, which is a most peculiar one. Uh, nobody knows actually what the disease, the sweating sickness, was, and it appeared it was called the English sweat because it appeared to people at the time as if only people of English descent got it. 
And so even foreigners um, in London didn't get it. And um, it tended to be younger, wealthier, actually, going back to the previous question, tavern-going men. Uh, so it was called the, uh, the gallant's disease because it, was, it tended to be <laughs> pub-going, wealthy English <laughs> Englishmen. So um, I hate to say it was a Brexit disease, it probably, that was probably a bit, a bit much, but, but def definitely it was seen as being very, very English. Uh, the Black Death, I think, was pretty, pretty much anybody was liable to get it. The um, Athenian and, and the plague of Justinian was similarly people nicked the plague, it could be pretty much anybody. Mm. Uh, the plague of Athens was probably typhus, but the city was very, very crowded at that point. That's a large number of refugees. Again, that was it was a plague just limited to just inside the city wall. It didn't spread outside at all. Mm. Fascinating. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, there, there are lots of questions flowing now. I knew that. I knew there would be. Um, but um, yeah, let's let's stick with the um, with the Spanish flu, um, the 1918 flu. And one of our um, one of our attendees um, asks, as someone whose grandparents died during the Spanish flu, what do you think the Spanish flu epidemic taught us in following decades? Uh, I think I think it did actually help establish the um, profession of uh, of public health, and public health institutions were were established. And um, clearly, one of the one of the difficulties, uh, uh, and and so the idea that you could ask people to wear to to wear masks. I mean, I think in very widely in this country it wasn't taken terribly seriously the, the mask wearing um, and it was it was more I think the regulations were things like cinemas needed to um, have half an hour gap between the two programs and open the doors and you know, a bit fresh, fresh air was required there was, but there was still a lot of public health measures in many places in many countries in Australia and many American cities and so the, um, mask wearing was was obligatory and so the idea that you could actually apply to people to behave in this way was was definitely new, but as 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 we've seen, there's a there's a gap between the best um, laid plans of, of mice and men in, in public health measures and their actual implementation. And, um, uh, Absolutely, and that's that's actually a very very um, good link to another question from from David, who says thanks for a wonderful talk. And why do you think authorities find it so difficult to land public health messages? And it seems it's always been a problem. Uh, probably partly because they are reluctant to spend on them in the first place. I mean, it's very sad, of course, reading Bill Gates writing um, after the Ebola, saying how the world needs to prepare for the next pandemic. And everything that he wrote in, in that piece is, is things that we have now all learned the governments all needed to do. And of course, none of them spent enough money and enough care and we didn't have the right, you know, the, the, we don't have to say what was going on in the United States. And here we were totally distracted as well by something which turns out to be less important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, uh, so Aileen asks, why do you think there weren't the same measures adopted, um, like lockdown, for example, for the flu pandemics in the 50s and 60s? Why weren't the lockdowns then? Um, I suppose, I mean, certainly people from the time are writing about it, saying, um, You sort of have to grin and bear it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a private disease, rather, rather like the, um, I was saying about the the Spanish flu itself, was sort of some, was something that happens behind locked doors, um, and um, also because in the, at that time, sixty years ago, the world was less living in a sort of just in time, deeply, deeply, closely embedded economy where everybody is moving around all the time but the, 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 you know I was at school at that point and I, I can vouch for it the fact that there was a sense that the rest of the 
the Far East, let's say, was a long way away. Now it's just a few hours away in an aeroplane for thousands of people. People are traveling around far, far more than they used to, both in, in both nationally and internationally. And so it perhaps was not spreading anything like so quickly. There are, of course, questions about um, the, the, the Hong Kong flu. There were two waves in the United States in 19, um, in the winter of um, 60, 8, 69, 69, 70, the end of the um, Woodstock Festival happened in, in the middle between those two waves. And there is an argument that says that it shouldn't have been allowed to take place in those other pop festivals. But um, I think there was no question that any, at that point that anybody was going to um, stop that kind of festival. It was, it, it, those, the, those questions seem to have not been in the air at all at that point, closing down those sort of mass gatherings. Okay, thank you. It's a really good question here about social change um, and a comment that COVID-19 has caused some social change, such as working from home. Mm -hmm. And can you think of any examples from other pandemics that have a similar change to the way people worked or interacted and did mm -hmm. they last? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I suppose, do, do, pan do pandemics change society? Well, uh, very good question. And the, the example that's always quoted is the Black Death, which of course killed perhaps half, perhaps even more than half the population of Europe. Um, even at the time, people were complaining that it was causing prices to rocket. Um, obviously, a shortage of labor and shortage of goods and shortage of trade. Um, and it is always said that um, that uh, the shortage of labor and rocketing prices effectively meant the end of serfdom and uh, um, the uh, advent of a universal labor, um, paid labor economy. Um, mm. The other example that's interesting is the plague of Justinian that I mentioned in the 540s, um, which is often quoted as being a major uh, cause of the decline of the power of Byzantium and then correspondingly the rise of uh, the, um, the Muslim world of Islam in the Eastern, Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, but then when you look at it, um, a lot of the argument about this must have happened is based on a kind of implication, uh, reading back, this is what happened to the Black Death, so it must, the same thing must have happened uh, back uh, a thousand years before, or 800 years before. And there have been some recent studies about demographic studies, economic studies, studies of agriculture and uh, archaeological studies and so on, of the second half of the sixth century AD, saying that nobody can actually produce any archaeological or archival evidence that there was any social change at all and it may have killed 10 million people but maybe the world recovered and even the black death you know um, just a few years later just a, I mean, obviously 59, uh, 1348 to 1351 just four or five years later the english were back marauding around in france big battles in poitiers capturing the french king ransoming him the french were able to raise massive ransom monies to get it, get him back so um yeah. it may half the population may have gone but they still managed to do the things they really enjoyed <laughs> the other half didn't really change but <laughs> that's interesting i was reflecting on the you know there's a comment early on in the pandemic i don't know whether it was the prime minister or one of, one of them, um, saying that, that we were all in the same boat, which of course isn't true. We're not at all in the same boat or even similar boats, but, but we're in the same storm. Um, I just wondered whether, um, whether you think this pandemic will do anything for you know, inequalities in society. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to think so? But uh, <laughs> I think one thing I've learned is uh, over this and many other things recently is that whatever I may or may not have learned in the lifetime of studying history that I'm useless at predicting the future. I would love for, for, uh, for, this pandemic, for the lesson of this pandemic to be that we need to pay attention to um, the public health resources and all other resources given to uh, the less well-off communities of our society and that there should be a to borrow a phrase a leveling up but uh, i'm not frankly holding my breath <laughs>
<laughs> okay, fair enough. Thank you. There's loads of questions in the in the Q and A box now, and we can't possibly get through all of them in the next three minutes. But I'm going to pick on two fairly big ones. Um, one being, what do you think we can take from past pandemics to help with this one? And the second being, how do you think historians of the future are going to look back at COVID-19? I think maybe from what I was just saying about the Black Death and the Plague of Justinian, many past pandemics actually have been a ripple in history rather than a massive wave of change. And so although we've all been hoping, and I was just saying that uh, we're going to uh, go back, we won't go back to the old normal. Maybe we have to expect that we will and have to work harder for that, that change that we all, you know, the changes that we all know, no need to come. Um, and the second question again, sorry. Uh, how will historians look back at this one? <sighs> I think they will look back and say that we were in some ways well served, in some ways badly served by our governments, depending on where in the world that we were. Yeah. And that we need to understand better than we do, how people really learn, not just the science of a situation, how the, how real information can be imparted and so how emotional responses need to be taken on board and responded to in a way that people can hear. Mm. Um, so that denial or conspiracy or fake news and all those other things can be can be dealt with and I think that we have a lot to learn there and there are I didn't have time to talk too much about it but there are other examples in the past the same all those same things coming up great thank you so much um and thanks uh, just all together for an absolutely fascinating talk there's lots of comments in the chat again about how you know how engrossing and fascinating the talk was so I'll, I'll make sure you get a copy of all of those um, <laughs> and um, can I thank the audience too for putting some questions so many interesting questions in there and can I apologize for not getting through to all of them because um, we could very much um, go on and on I'm sure but we'd like to finish promptly so can I remind everyone that the recording of this event will be available on the festival YouTube, YouTube channel which can be accessed from the Watch Again section of the festival website after the 20th of June. You'll be contacted by email when the video is available to, be, to view and don't forget to recommend it to others. If you'd like to purchase a copy of Peter's book, and I know that some of you would from comments in the chat box, copies of Plague, Pestil Pestilence and Pandemic. Here it is, very good read. Sorry, upside down, that way, that works better. Um, with signed book plates will be available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. And for more information on book sales, please see the festival website or head directly to foxlanebooks.co.uk slash festival hyphen of hyphen ideas. The um, link I think is in the chat box. We very much hope that you'll continue to be engaged with the York Festival of Ideas. Do check out the website, yorkfestivalofideas.com for full details of all of the events in the festival programme. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this event, on the future events, and please do continue the conversations using the hashtag YorkIdeas. So um, it just remains for me again to thank the audience for fascinating questions and to thank Peter very much for an absolutely engrossing talk. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.